well thank you uh thanks for joining me this afternoon where we are going to be uh looking at introducing jesus christ and uh and you might you might start actually by asking the question well does jesus really need any introducing at all um look at this uh, fairly well-known statement made some years ago by the author james heffley who said i'm within the mark when i say that all the armies that ever marched and all the navies that ever were built and all the parliaments that ever sat and all the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of man upon this earth as powerfully as has that one solitary life and he's thinking there of course about jesus and the impact that jesus has had so it's it's absolutely true to say that jesus christ is the most influential person who has ever lived and yet i, I think actually that although that's maybe acknowledged by many um a lot of people would actually still say that they don't really know jesus that well at all uh, though they might accept that he's been influential, if you were to say, well, what do you know about him? The answer may be, well, not a great deal, really. So um, it's time then to introduce Jesus. And uh, I'm going to do that this afternoon, briefly. And we're going to do it by answering these questions I've put on the screen here. Who was Jesus? When did he live? What did he do? Why did he do what he did? And I guess the ultimate question that makes it relevant for you and me, so what? What's the relevance of, of all this that we might learn about a man who lived in Palestine 2,000 years ago? So let's, uh, let's delay no longer and get into trying to answer these questions then. First of all, thinking about who Jesus was. And actually the first question that we have to tackle are on that is to answer well was jesus actually a real person uh, it's certainly an argument that is uh, is put out there by um, by atheists by critics of the bible to say actually he was just a mythical person that was made up um, centuries later but in fact jesus was a real person and uh, and there is plenty of textual evidence to this even outside of the bible record although you and i might be happy to take the bible as a historical record even when we go outside of that in contemporary writings by people like the the jewish historian josephus and others um, and and those who followed on from them we have records of the man named jesus from nazareth as having really existed and some of the things that he did so, yes, he was a real person. He was born a Jew and he lived in uh, the land of Israel, as we might know it. But it was actually a number of separate uh, countries at the time, Judea, Galilee, Samaria, all, all part of what we today might call Israel. Because at that time it was a, a Roman occupied region of the Middle East um, and Jesus growing up in that region had his mother Mary um, and Mary herself um, was a descendant of the famous Israelite King David. David had lived about a thousand years before um, Jesus but Mary was uh, she was descended from him and in actual fact the the life of Jesus and the things that he did are narrated to us not just in one record in one story but actually in the four gospel records that we have in the New Testament of our Bible in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. So that's that's who Jesus was. And we but we need to we need to explore that a little bit more, I think, and say, well, was Jesus just a man then? Is that is that all all he is? A man who lived 2000 years ago? No, there's more to Jesus than that, because there's something absolutely unique in, in the uniquest sense of the word unique um, about Jesus which is that he had Mary as his mother but Jesus did not have a human father. I wonder if you can uh, open your Bibles please in the New Testament to the Gospel of Luke and chapter one and we'll just read there from the, the words which the angel Gabriel sent by God spoke to Mary 2,000 years ago. 
and uh, and Gabriel came and told her that uh, that she was going to have a child which given that she was engaged to a man to be married soon um, I guess if somebody said well one day you'll have a child that's uh, that's maybe no no big shakes uh, but in this case she wasn't yet married and and wanted to know how this would actually come about um, verse 34 of Luke chapter 1 says Mary said to the angel how can this be since I do not know a man and the angel answered and said to her the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you therefore also that holy one who is to be born will be called the son of God and then that's the thing that makes Jesus absolutely unique that Mary his mother who was going to conceive him actually would conceive him not through Joseph to whom she was one day soon going to be married um, but actually through the power of God through the Holy Spirit thereby making Jesus none other than the son of God. Perhaps the most, most interesting thing about this statement which the, the angel makes to Mary is that actually in, in one way this is not news at all because this is something that God had actually promised a thousand years before. It was when God had made a promise to King David, Mary's own ancestor, God had said that this was going to happen. Here we are back in the Old Testament in the second book of Samuel chapter 7 and it's also recorded in the book of Chronicles. God through the prophet says to David, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body, so a descendant of David, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son. So God in talking to King David and talking about a descendant of his who was to be born, who was going to reign on David's throne forever, God says to David, actually, although he's your descendant, I'll be his father and he will be my son. So when, uh, when that news is given to Mary that she's going to give birth to the son of God, actually it brings, brings to life this promise that God had made to David a thousand years before. It wasn't a new idea. It was one actually that people had been waiting for for a thousand years already. Let's just think then about the, uh, the implications of, of this then, that, that Jesus is this absolute unique person um, who has Mary as his mother, but God as his father. Does that mean then that Jesus is, is supernatural? Does, does this make Jesus God in some way? Is he divine? Is he, is he equal to God? Actually, this is a question that a number of people challenged Jesus about and asked him about. Um, and we, we find in the pages of the Gospels, it's actually something that people are still questioning today and, uh, and often get wrong. Um, and the answer to this question is that is no, Jesus wasn't supernatural uh, like God himself. Um, Jesus did not have the, the nature of, of, of the, the all powerful, all, um, all eternal um, God in heaven. In fact, what we read about Jesus when we come to read about him in the Gospels is that Jesus was still just a man because he was born of Mary. Jesus had the same nature as you and me. In fact, it's Luke's Gospel record as you read through that where in particular Jesus always refers to himself not as the son of God, but as the son of man. It's as if Jesus is drawing our attention to the fact that he is a man that he's like you and me, a human being. And we see that in what we read about him. Jesus lived. Jesus also died. That's something that God cannot do. God cannot die. God is eternal. Jesus breathed. Jesus uh, experienced sensations like hunger and thirst. And we read about that in the gospel records. Jesus had feelings. We see uh, Jesus happy but we see Jesus sad we see Jesus angry on occasions we see Jesus filled with compassion that really moved in in his feelings for others we see Jesus actually being tempted to sin that there was within Jesus the 
the propensity that could have led him to sin. But actually, on that point, what we also read in our Bibles is that although Jesus was tempted, Jesus never gave in. The, um, the propensity that we have, that we often give in to, Jesus never went down that road. He never disobeyed God. And actually, that's, that's um, made clear to us as we go on as well in the New Testament. For example, in Hebrews in chapter 4, we're told about Jesus. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And that's interesting, isn't it? Because in that one verse there in Hebrews, we're, we're being told that Jesus was a man like us in so many ways. He, he can sympathize with us because he's been there. But at the same time, though he was tempted, he was without sin. So that, that's who Jesus is then. And we can perhaps begin to see um, and get a feel for the kind of person that he was. And that in some ways, not so unlike you and me today. In other ways, very different, of course. So let's, let's just um, think about the when. When, when exactly did, uh, did Jesus live? I've kind of thrown it in already a couple of times by dropping in a a time period actually the 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 uh, the timing of jesus birth and his appearance on the scene is is fairly well pinpointed for us if you're still in luke's gospel just turn over the page now to a uh, to chapter two and see what we read there luke, luke chapter two and uh, and the the first I'd, I'd find it myself if i could turn the page properly here we are the first couple of verses of this chapter we read there that it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. And, uh, and, it's, and it's those little details there that Luke gives us um, that pinpoint for us that there's a very specific time period when Quirinius was governing Syria. And, and it takes us to around four BC, so just over two thousand years ago. Yes, I know. I know it's very ironic that uh, Jesus was born around four years before Christ, and that's because the person who who coined the uh, the time periods BC and AD got got his starting point wrong because he he was several hundred years later when that was done. But nevertheless, Jesus born around four BC. That's uh, that's the when. Um, and Jesus, we read, grew up uh, in Nazareth in the, the region, the Roman governed region of Galilee. Um, and we read that at about the age of 30, he was baptized by none other than John the Baptist. Um, and in fact, it's in the next chapter of Luke that we read that. At that point, he becomes what we might call today a traveling preacher. Um, we read that uh, in Luke 3 verse 23, now, Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age. So somewhere in the late AD 20s. Um, that's the when. And, and in a way, we don't need to know much more about the when of, of Jesus' life and his, his ministry than that. What's much more important, of course, is, is to think about what Jesus did um, we were told there that he, he started his ministry. What did that ministry um, comprise? Well, one of the things we learn straight after the baptism of Jesus in, in Luke chapter three is that at, the, at his baptism, Jesus was given unlimited power by God, his father. Uh, the power of God, which is, is described as the Holy Spirit, comes upon Jesus without measure. And, and so then for three and a half years, um, Jesus goes around the towns in Galilee and Judea and very occasionally outside of those areas into places like Samaria and, and Tyre and Sidon. Um, and Jesus is, is following a ministry where he's talking to people with a very consistent message. And, and it's what the, the New Testament calls the gospel. The good news. Let's have a let's have a look at a, a couple of summaries of this message of Jesus. Come back, if you will, first of all, please, to Mark's gospel and chapter one. Mark's gospel and chapter one. And this 
this is where we get just a little a little very short summary of what it was that Jesus was doing in this three and a half year period. Mark's Gospel, chapter one, and we'll start at verse 14. This is this is after the baptism of Jesus, after he's been given this power from God, after he's been tempted, says verse 14. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So there he is going around, talking to people, preaching. He's telling them good news. And his good news is that the kingdom of God is coming. And he tells people they need to believe this and to repent. That's what uh, that's what we read in that little summary in, uh, in Mark's gospel. And actually, if you come back to Matthew's record uh, of the of the equivalent point at the beginning of, of Jesus ministry, we have something very similar, but a, a little bit of expansion on that. Come back to Matthew four and. Uh, and this time we'll go in at verse 23. This is just a little, maybe a little bit later on uh, in the, the work that Jesus does. And what do we read there? Verse 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments and those who were demon possessed, epileptics and paralytics. And he healed them. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea and beyond Jordan. So uh, there we are, a little bit more um, given to us there in Matthew about what Jesus did. And actually, just from those those two short descriptions that we get there from from the beginning of Jesus ministry, we're actually told about two elements that there were really two big elements to, to that three and a half years when Jesus was going around uh, the land of Israel. And, and this is what Jesus did. Let, let's think about these two elements and, and what it means. The first thing that we're, we were told was that Jesus went around teaching men and women. And, and we saw there, didn't we, in, in a, particularly in Mark, what he was saying to people. He was saying to people, look, the kingdom of God is coming. Um, Jesus was telling them ab about something promised in their Old Testament, that their, their Bible, saying that God was going to, to restore this earth and, and bring it back to, to perfection, to, to make it back like it was at creation again. And, and Jesus was telling people that they, they all actually could have a part in that. The, the good news about the kingdom of God was that a, a wonderfully restored world was a world where these men and women could, could actually live. But they needed to believe that. It was no good just thinking, oh, this is some kind of pipe dream that'll never happen. It's something God had promised and they needed to believe it was coming. And if they wanted to be part of it, they needed to repent. That was what we read in Mark, wasn't it? Repent. Um, that meant that they needed to change their ways. In other words, they needed to, to live as people who actually are waiting for God's kingdom. You know, if God wanted them to be there, but if they wanted to be there, they needed to live as if they already were. And Jesus himself in his own life set a perfect example for them. Remember, tempted in every way, like us, but without sin. Actually, what Jesus did as he lived out his life before these men and women was he showed to them and demonstrated to them the loving character of his own father so that through, through Jesus, people could actually see what God is like and, and how God wanted them to be as well. Let's have a think a little bit more then about the these teachings of Jesus then, because actually the, the four gospel records are full of them. Uh, there's many things that Jesus said and taught that are there. And actually, um, th those words of Jesus that we have in the four gospel records were for their time. And actually, even today, if you think about it, a revolutionary message. This was like something the people he spoke to had never heard before. It really did challenge them and in actual fact um 
what, what Jesus was doing for these men and women, he was bringing to life for them what God's law in the Old Testament had been trying to teach them. See, the trouble was over the centuries that the, the Jewish religious leaders had built a whole lot of walls around God's law, had added so much more to it that the, that the, the real message of God's laws had been obscured. People didn't really know what God was trying to teach them. It was all cloaked and veiled. And what Jesus tried to do then was to open it up so that they could see what God actually wanted. And very often Jesus did this using parables, like, like the picture I've put on screen there of the, uh, the parable of the sower. Um, let's, uh, let's, just have a, let's just have a look at, uh, at some, of the, some of the really important principles then that Jesus was trying to teach men and women in, in what he said to them. We'll, uh, we'll stay in Matthew's record and come over, if you will, to Matthew chapter 22. Actually, Matthew 22, we're, we're right at the end of Jesus' ministry. This is then uh, three and a half years in, give or take a week. And, uh, and there's, a, there's a question put to, um, put to Jesus at this time. Matthew 22. And let's start actually at verse, uh, verse 34 so you can get a bit, bit of context here. Uh, when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, so Jesus had put to silence all these Jewish religious leaders, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And there, there you go. There, there's the, there's the, the two key principles that, that Jesus taught. And actually, if you look at all the things that Jesus said, everything he says was trying to bring to life those uh, those those two teachings that men and women should should learn to love God and to love one another to love one's neighbor as oneself so this is what Jesus was teaching and that this is this is one big element of what Jesus did for those three and a half years he he taught men and women about the, the good news and how how they themselves could change their lives to be men and women waiting for God's kingdom. But that's only one part of what Jesus did, because we read about something else that Jesus was doing while he was going around teaching people, didn't we? We read about the actions of Jesus as well. Because what Jesus did was he used that marvellous power given to him by God for good. And we read back in those early verses in Matthew 4 that Jesus healed the sick. Uh, that Jesus went around, he fed the hungry on occasions. Jesus even went as far as to raise the dead again. Jesus defied nature by calming storms on the Sea of Galilee and the, the like. Um, and Jesus was doing th something quite special here in, in using his power in this way. See, in all these miracles that Jesus did, Jesus was showing to men and women the actual reality of what the kingdom of God would be like. So men and women were looking forward to this, this time that was, was written about in the Old Testament, but, uh, but in seeing Jesus do these things, these miracles, they, they could actually see before their very eyes what that kingdom would one day would, would bring about in, in reality. And, and if, if nothing else, actually, the miracles Jesus did were evidence to men and women that the kingdom of God will come one day that uh, that you although uh, you might look at the the details of the kingdom of God and go oh, no, I think it can never be like that the world can never be be made so good again and all the problems sorted out actually when men and women saw Jesus do miracles they'd be left in no doubt that that what God said about his kingdom absolutely could come to pass because here was a man making it possible in front of their eyes 
in fact we can we can see some very clear links between what the old testament said about the kingdom of god and what it will be like and the things that jesus did and all the miracles he he performed have have a look at this this um, this fairly well known prophecy that's there in the old testament in the prophet isaiah where in chapter 35 isaiah prophesies about just what it will be like in the kingdom of god and look at the things he says um that will it will be like in that day isaiah prophesies then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the dumb sing for water shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert and and here's the thing that that this prophecy which Isaiah made 700 years before Jesus came along, a prophecy that's still to have its fulfillment in the future in the kingdom of God, that prophecy was actually replayed time and time again right in front of people when Jesus was there because these are the sorts of things that Jesus did. He opened the eyes of the blind. He unstopped the ears of the deaf. He made, made the lame to be able to leap. He made the, the dumb uh, be able to uh, be able to speak and, and to sing he jesus showed to the men and women right in front of them what they could look forward to in the kingdom of god because he actually made it happen right there and then if only they would believe then they could actually have a part in that kingdom uh, in the future so we can we can actually we can actually understand just how important it was that jesus did those miracles that here he was talking about the good news of the kingdom but this this good news of the kingdom wasn't just some kind of a utopia that existed in the mind this was a real kingdom and jesus was showing men and women um actually the kind of people who would be there by the way he lived and the sort of life men and women would have by the miracles that he did so what happened to Jesus then? Here was this man with, with amazing power given to him by God. Here was a man who showed the character of God in everything that he did. Here was a man who was the only begotten son of God. How, how did his nation respond to having that man right in their midst? How would you and I have responded if we'd have been there then? Well, early on, maybe not surprisingly they tried to make him king don't forget god had promised to king david a thousand years before that this this descendant of his who would have god as his father would be the king in fact uh, in john's gospel after he'd fed the five thousand we read that uh, jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king so he departed again to the mountain by himself alone it's actually a real temptation to jesus to allow himself to become king but that wasn't his purpose at that time and he and he made sure he steered clear of that well that's how his nation responded early on but um, after three and a half years even after all the things that jesus did for them and, and taught them his own people rejected him in fact it was the jewish leaders those pharisees and sadducees that we read of a minute ago who eventually had him arrested they they tried him they, they actually falsely accused jesus of blasphemy because jesus admitted before them that he was indeed the son of god and because they didn't believe that then to them that was blasphemy against god and on the, on the grounds of that they had him condemned to die as a criminal and so they handed him over to the romans to be tortured and to be crucified Of course, for anyone else, that would have been the end, wouldn't it? But it wasn't the end for Jesus. You see, what, what we've been seeing just by having a look at the life of Jesus is that what we have here, as we saw from the letter to the Hebrews right at the start, was that here is the only person who's ever lived to lead a sinless life. He's the only man of whom we could actually say, do you know, he, this man didn't deserve what is the wages of sin. 
which is death, because this man had never committed a sin. And what God did was he actually raised Jesus from the dead again on the third day. Not just to live out a natural life and die again as an old man, uh, but in fact God raised Jesus from the dead on the third day to live now forever. And, and in fact, as we get to the end of the gospel records and go on into the book of Acts, we, we read that 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus ascended to heaven to, to be at God's right hand. And that's where Jesus is today. Jesus, although, although we might think of Jesus as a historical figure, because what we read about him is, is 2000 years ago. Actually, Jesus is still alive today at the right hand of God. Now, we may very well ask the question, why? Why, why? why did this man go through his life in the way he did? Why, why did he allow himself actually to be killed? And why did God permit it? You know, given that Jesus had all this power from God and could presumably have easily prevented himself from being arrested and tried and crucified, why did Jesus go through with that? And why did why did God allow that? Was was this some some tragic miscarriage of justice and, and shouldn't actually have, have ever happened? Well, from from a human point of view, we might say that that's the case. But that's not what the Bible has to say. The Bible actually says, no, actually, th this was no tragedy uh, in, in it being a a miscarriage of justice that, that should never have happened and you know what was God doing not allowing it to go ahead actually what the Bible makes really clear to you and me is that the death of Jesus and the way he died and his resurrection afterwards are absolutely central to God's plan for saving mankind there's there's, there's no mishap or chance about any of this whatsoever let's uh, let's go uh, for a final passage to the uh, the book of Acts as, as we move on um, in, in our New Testament to, to what happened next, we'll, we'll read some words of the Apostle Peter, one of Jesus' 12 closest disciples. And this is, this is uh, no more than seven weeks after, uh, well, actually seven weeks in a day, to be honest, um, after the, uh, the, the death of Jesus on the cross. And Peter is, is talking seven weeks later to um, to a Jewish audience who were still there in Jerusalem, many of whom would have been there when Jesus had been crucified. The, the, the events of, of that weekend would, would still be very, uh, very real in, the, uh, in the, the memories of many of this Jewish audience. And what does Peter say to them in, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 22? He says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. So, so Peter draws on the fact that many of these people would actually have witnessed those miracles that Jesus did. And he says, look, you know, you, you know that Jesus did this stuff. And this was God working through him uh, through by giving Jesus that power. What next? Verse 23. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Do you see there in, in the middle of verse 23, although Peter, although Peter points the finger at his own nation and says, look, you, you're the ones who took Jesus and had him crucified, and it was God who raised him from the dead. Nevertheless, he says, actually, this was all part of God's planned purpose from the beginning. This was the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God at work. God knew this would happen and it was all part of his great plan. And, and Peter's going to go on and explain that plan to, uh, to, to his audience now um, that actually and we see this as we read through our both our Old and our New Testaments. What was actually happening was that Jesus was giving his life, not unwillingly when he was crucified, but actually as a willing sacrifice. So that our sins could be taken away 
it's uh, we're told that it's through the death of Jesus that you and me today could could receive the forgiveness of sins and and actually his resurrection is is a, a wonderful message for men and women as well because the resurrection of Jesus to to this everlasting life on the third day is actually providing a promise from God that uh, that God is is able and God is willing to raise others from the dead to live forever as well it's those people that God wants to be in his kingdom on earth who will be raised from the dead to live forever with Jesus on this earth. So really, the, the, the good news that Jesus started to teach people about when he was teaching them for three and a half years, well, Jesus is actually at the centre of that good news, that gospel message. He's the reason that there is good news. See, the good news is not just that the kingdom of God can come and will come on this earth, the good news is that men and women can have a part in that kingdom through the death and resurrection of Jesus himself. And, uh, and that's, actually, that's actually explained to us just in, in really brief words in, in probably the best known verse in the Bible. It's there in John chapter 3 and verse 16, where we're told that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You see that it wasn't just that, uh, that, that God wanted to have a, a child of his own. It was actually that God gave his son, gave him so that men and women could, could see him and experience and understand what God is like, but also that he would give his life so that people believing in him would themselves have a hope of life rather than of perishing forever which brings us then to the the final question and in a way we're, we're answering it as we've gone along uh, this afternoon you know the so what question what does all this mean for you and me you know we've really we've really quickly whizzed through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus this afternoon because it's actually it packs out four gospel records in our new testament but what does it mean for us 2,000 years after these events took place? Well, remember, the thing that Jesus did when he went around was he taught men and women to believe in God's coming kingdom. And, uh, and, and that's the same for you and me today. The words of Jesus and his actions are still trying to get you and me as well to put our faith in, in that promise for the future, that we too should believe in the kingdom. And, and actually, while Jesus was doing that, Jesus showed to men and women what, what God is like. Um, Jesus himself isn't God, but Jesus so flawlessly displayed the character of God that Jesus was able to say at the end of his, his life before he was crucified, that actually those who, who looked at him could actually see God because they would see the character of God in his life. And we can do that today as well. We can see what Jesus uh, is like and appreciate from that what God himself is like. Jesus showed to men and women what the kingdom of God will be like by all those miracles which he did. And, and when we read about them, it's showing to you and me today as well what the kingdom of God will be like so that it helps us to believe it's coming. And what is asked of you and me today is no different to what was asked of people 2000 years ago. We are asked to believe in Jesus as well and to believe that his death and his resurrection provides a way for us to be in God's kingdom. You know, that there's, there's so much on offer. There isn't the through uh, through Jesus himself. We can find a, a hope of life forever in the future through him. It's the Apostle Peter who only two chapters later in Acts chapter four says to the same Jewish leaders who crucified Jesus, he says, there's no other name given under heaven by which we can be saved. And therefore, if it's only through Jesus Christ that we can be saved, we need to ask the question of ourselves today. Well, is it time for us to get to know Jesus better so that we can put our trust and our faith in him, believe in him 
and so be saved. Thank you.